Digitizing Delmarva Heritage and Traditions. We're here today to talk with Ace Parker about the history of forestry and its significance here on the Delmarva Peninsula. Ace, welcome to the program. Thank you. You've seen in uh, 40 years, I guess, 48 years of being a forester here, forester on the Eastern Shore, a uh, great number of changes. Let's just talk about what it was like back when they were using mules in the woods uh, on the Delmarva Peninsula. Well, uh, uh, back when uh, I first came to the shore, uh, there were a lot of mules being used, and uh, uh, we didn't call them mules, we called them hay burners. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously you had to feed the mules in, uh, in order to uh, maintain them and, and keep them in working condition. But uh, in the forest industry, they were uh, uh, most important component in that they were used from the point of time when the tree was cut down, it was drug up to the mill by mules, horses, and mules, and oxen. Oxen? Oxen, yeah. Uh, and then uh, after the lumber was cut, uh, in many instances, they loaded the lumber on wagons, and it was pulled out of the woods on wagons by horses and or mules and or oxen. Uh, one of the guys, older gentleman that I remember, uh, Mr. Ed Dickinson, he was from Delmar, or vicinity of Delmar, and uh, he he was a wonderful woodsman, and he told me about. It. He says, uh, uh, "Yes, uh, I had me uh, the way he said it, and I won't forget it. Uh, me had me uh, oxen when I first oxen when I was twelve years old." My daddy had a, a sawmill, and uh, he gave me a, a pair of oxen, and uh, I drug timber with them and pulled a log cart and uh, pulled lumber out of the woods with them. And uh, uh, that had to have been, he's been dead for a while, and he lived quite a long time, but that had to have been in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But even up into uh, the 60s, mules and horses were still used to, in the woods to, uh, once the trees were cut down, to drag them up to the mill or get them up to the mill in some way uh, to be sawed in, into lumber. Um, now those mules and horses and oxen were replaced by modern equipment. Uh, describe the modern equipment, the skidders and so on. Well, it sort of went through several stages. Initially, after uh, we stopped using the mules uh, and farm tractors came into existence. And uh, we used farm tractors. Uh, they modified what we call the log carts, which uh, would uh, take a, a pile of logs up to the sawmill, big wheel carts uh, pulled by mules and they modified them so that they hooked them behind a tractor and uh, pulled it you know, rather than pulling with the mules. And then they further modified them, now we'll forget this, uh, right around World War II or shortly after, they got airplane wheels with the big tires on them. And they put those on these log carts versus the old wooden wheels with the steel rim and it was easier to pull and they could uh, uh, get around through the woods better with it and all. And uh, so then they, that eventually, and then sometime in the early 60s, I think, is when uh, some of the skidders, modern, what we call it, skidder, it's a big tractor that has a winch on it that uh, they pull the logs out with. And during that, how those evolved was that uh, people got a lot of the excess army equipment. I mentioned the tires, uh, airplane wheels and tires, but uh, the old uh, army duck, I don't know if you remember, that was a sort of a landing barge that could go on land or water. And uh, 
people could buy those things pretty cheap from Army Surplus, and they would take the main frame off of it and modify it and put a winch on it in some hmm. way, and uh, uh, they called them short dogs. <laughs> and we used those, uh, especially in the pulpwood end of it, of, of getting uh, pulpwood out. And so then uh, the skitter itself came into existence, and at first it was just straight uh, frame on it, and after a while, I got the frame so it did articulate it. And uh, instead of having a cable, it, initially the skidders had a cable on it, and they had to take the cable and run around the trees to pull to hook up to the skidder and pull it out. And uh, then that evolved into uh, what we call grabs, like a big set of arms that would just scoop right around the logs and lift them up and, and pull them out. And uh, then from that has evolved into a machine that cuts the tree down, uh, will cut the limbs off of it, and lay it in a pile mm. so that the skidder can pick it up and take it out of the woods. So that has evolved from, from the mules or, or from animals, so to speak. Well, talking about the mules again, uh, you mentioned that... Uh, the, the mules were fairly easy to train. Uh, tell us about some of, the, some of that history. Well, uh, the way it used to be, the, you cut the tree down. Of course, they used, initially used cross-cut saws, manual saw, two-man saw. They'd cut the tree down, and then they would use an ax to limb the tree, to cut all of the limbs off of it. And then they would cut it up into logs anywhere from eight to 16 feet long, depending upon how straight the tree was or how many crooks it had in it or what. And in some instances, they cut them 20 feet long. Uh, but uh, uh, after they cut the logs up, they had what they call a piling mule or horse. And uh, it was a horse that just had uh, traces or chains that went back and hooked into a set of grabs that hooked into like ice tongs is what they looked like. They would hook into the side of the log and then the, uh, uh, the man that handled the horse would give the horse a, a command and he would take him first to a place where he wanted to, to start a pile. And the horse would stop there. He would give him a command. Uh, I've forgotten some of the commands that they, they used, but the horse would obey him just, it was amazing. And they would stop, they'd unhook the grabs, and then the horse would go back to the same spot that it had just come from to get the next log out of that tree. And he'd give the command, and the horse would know exactly where to go. He might be walking 10 or 15 feet or further away from the horse up to undo the grabs, but that horse knew exactly where to go and would stop when the log was up even with the other one, and the guy would unhook it. And, and he'd give it a command, and it would go back to that tree again. And, and keep doing it. And keep doing it Until all they day. finished that pile, and then he'd train him to go. But all he had to do was take him one time. Isn't that amazing? It is. I always thought mules were hard to train, but... Uh, well, uh, mo a lot of times, it looks like to me, most of them I remember were piling horses. Maybe the horses were the smarter. Horses, yeah. But there were also mules that did that. But then there were mules that, primarily mules and oxen, that they hooked to the log carts that picked up those pile of logs and took it to the mill or wherever. We keep hearing about loblolly pine. What is it about the Delmarva Peninsula that makes this area uh, good for growing loblolly pines? Well, it's because of the, the uh, soil. Uh, loblolly pine, uh, primarily grows in the coastal plain of the United States. And obviously we're in the coastal plain. Uh, it's, it's flat, it's a relatively sandy soil. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, growing season here. Uh, by that I mean the length of time that uh, trees and plants grow. And it's amazing at uh, I've forgotten the exact figure, but every hundred miles it's so many days shorter in the growing season. And 
as you, I'm sure, have noticed on the shore that down on the peninsula of Virginia, they start uh, harvesting and growing vegetables and things before we do up here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 100 miles approximately. And uh, so the trees grow a little bit longer there than they do here. And the further south you go, the longer they grow. We are primarily in the northernmost range of the Loblolly Pine. It does go across uh, the bay or the Delaware Bay over into Jersey, New Jersey. There is some Loblolly Pine over there, but that is about the northernmost region mm -hmm. for Loblolly Pine. What makes the, what's, what's the value of the Loblolly Pine? What's it used for? Well, it's used for just, that's, a, that's a one, one of the reasons it's so valuable because it's so versatile. It can be used for so many things. Uh, the, one of the, the most uh, elite or expensive product are your poles and piling. Uh, they bring a premium price. And incidentally, uh, the 1938 World's Fair was uh, built on piling from the eastern shore. 1938, was that Chicago? Chicago, where was, uh, where, when was the one in New York? I think that was. Well, maybe that was New York, yeah. I don't, I don't know, but they, they hauled them up there. And uh, it was amazing at how, did, how they hauled that. They had uh, small truck tractors. When I say a tractor, you know, uh, uh, one that pulls a truck. Uh-huh, uh, semi. Yeah. yeah, would just be uh, a six-wheeler, and uh, they had what they call bunks up on the on the back of that, and uh, then they would have uh, another set of wheels with a bunk on it that was completely separated. It wasn't joined together, and they would hold that thing up right and lay the long piling on there, and some of them were 100 feet long, and they would just lay it right on there, and chained it down to this one in the back and chained it down to the truck so there was nothing in between. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was yeah. no, no truck bed. It was just the logs themselves that were just holding it together. Just the logs themselves, and they, they hauled that stuff up to New York City. Now, were they creosoted? Uh, in some instances they were, and some they weren't. And uh, I remember sometime during the 60s or 70s, that they dug some of those things up and they were still good. They'd been in the ground where no air could get to them and all, and uh -huh. they were still good and they reused some of them. Yeah. Is the loblolly pine, well, I guess the most obvious feature is it's straight. Yes, it's very straight and for the most part it has small knots on it. A knot will tend to make the wood weaker. It's a point that it will break around the knots. But uh, because the uh, loblolly pine is an even age species, uh, by that and it's by that I mean it's intolerant to shade, so it sheds all its limbs off. If the limbs can't get light, they die and fall off. Whereas on a hardwood, they don't necessarily do that. They can stay in the shade. So you a lot of times you don't have as much of a clear trunk on a hardwood as you do on a love lot of pine. And that's what makes them so valuable. So if you look at a, a, a stand of loblolly pine that's 25 years old, do you see new growth starting to come up under the old growth or what? That's a good point. No, you don't. Uh, you'll see hardwoods come up in the understory of stands of pine, but uh, young pines don't come up because they can't get to light. The, the older pines there, have the crowns have shaded out the area, so the young pines can't grow. But uh, you can go through a stand of pine and if an area in there where a little fire started or a lightning strike or something that kills trees, then you'll see the young pines coming up where they can get light. But they have to have full sunlight in order to, to germinate and to grow. Now is that, that particular feature uh, that all of the pines are pretty much the same age and height and everything else is why when they harvest it, they clear cut? That, that's, that's true. That is uh, the reason we do that. It's, it's what we call an even age species. 
When you st see a stand of pine, all of the trees in there are essentially the same age. Whereas if you go into a stand of hardwood, they will vary in age from very young to real old, but not in the pine stands. They're, they're within a couple of years or one year in most cases of being the same age. So another, I guess uh, you talked about poles and pilings. Uh, every utility pole on the eastern shore of Maryland, the Delmarva Peninsula, is a pine, or started out as a pine tree. Then it was somehow uh, made uh, more, uh, it was treated with something to make it last longer when it was buried in the ground. Because some of those, some of those uh, utility poles are pretty old, aren't they? Oh yeah, they are. And that's uh, the other good thing about your pine trees, it will absorb or take up uh, these preservatives much better than the hardwoods will. And uh, so it gets more of it into the tree, so consequently they are into that pole, it will last longer. The other interesting thing about the uh, poles, uh, piling and poles, when uh, I first came to the shore, the way they got the bark off of these things, because you have to get the bark off of them before you can treat them. Oh. And uh, was that uh, there were crews of men that used a spade, and they kept those things razor sharp, and they would just go up and down the tree and peel the bark right off with that spade. And they got paid so much per foot for doing this. And uh, some of these guys really made uh, good money because they, they had, an, number one, they had an extremely sh sharp spade that they kept sharp. And uh, they kept that spade close. That was just like having a gun out west, I guess, yeah. you know, a good comparison. Uh, and they had a good ax because they would have to trim some of the knots and all. But, uh, and then that eventually uh, developed into machines that now they take the whole tree in and they run it through the machine and it will uh, take the bark off. And then they run it through another machine that's like a planer that planes it pole real smooth, makes it uh, more uniform and smooth. Mm -hmm. And of course they've developed uses for the bark, they, they, they mulch that up or use it as mulch. Um, use it as mulch and use it as fuel also yeah. to burn. And uh, uh, the, the, when they run it through these machines, the, the shavings or, or the pole, what we call pole peelings uh, makes excellent chicken litter. Well, let's talk about the, the growth of the poultry industry and the, its connection with the forestry industry. That, that litter, is that, is that, uh, has that always been the best use of that, I guess it's sawdust and chips as bedding for in the poultry houses? Yes, uh, it was, as, uh, as I remember, it first started sometime in the 60s when the poultry, uh, whenever it was that poultry industry started to take off here. Uh, initially they started using uh, the sawdust and the shavings from the planer mill, when they planed the lumber, they would get shavings. And they used that uh, for litter. Uh, prior to the chicken industry really starting, they always burned that or left the, uh, if it was a portable mill out in the woods, they just left the uh, uh, sawdust in big piles out in the woods. And uh, side note, uh, these sawdust piles a lot of times were the source of fires in that the sawdust would go through a heat and a fire would uh, start as a result huh. of it. And they had to burn the slabs, the slabs that they cut off the edge of the logs, they would burn them or, or sell them for firewood or give it away people most of the time just to get rid of it. And then when the mills, sawmills became more stationary at a central point like Wells and Paul Jones, Milton Laws, Cropper Brothers, uh, Dorchester Lumber Company, the name Spicer, to name a few of the mills. Uh, when they became stationary, they had burners, TP burners that we call them, shaped like a TP, that they put the slabs in and burn them up just to get rid of them because they didn't have where to put them. 
So then when the poultry industry came along, they started using the sawdust and the shavings. So in many instances, the uh, uh, sawmills got rid of these teepee burners because they had a way of getting rid of the waste. They could yeah. chip up the slabs and all. And then uh, the poultry industry had a dip down. They got kind of slack. And uh, so they weren't using anywhere near the amount of litter that they had been using. And the guys had nowhere to put this, what they call waste material at that point. So they had to slow down. The mills had to slow down taking the logs, consequently slowed down the loggers of, of cutting and slowed down people selling timber because it just wasn't a demand. And then all of a sudden, I guess the chicken industry took off again and uh, we couldn't produce enough waste material from the mills here. And uh, the chicken industry started getting, uh, first thing I remember was peanut holes from across the bay to uh, help put the chicken litter. They actually uh, experimented, uh, I guess it was back in the 80s, they experimented with taking uh, recycled newspapers and there were these companies that would extract the ink out of the paper and then make pellets uh, to be used as litter. But um, they went through the labs at, uh, down at Purdue and they determined that in a uh, 70,000 chickens, they would, that it was one cent or two cents more expensive or something like that to use the recycled newspapers. So they went back to the, they stayed with the litter. Yeah. But I guess that's the best example of recycling there yeah. is because they take that litter after the chicken waste is accumulated over one or two flocks or I don't know how many flocks. They clean that out and put it back on the fields as fertilizer. Right. It's great fertilizer. Isn't yeah. that a, that's, that's a good example of recycling. Yeah. So the, the um, uh, what about the hardwoods? What about oaks and... Uh, uh, hickory and all the other hardwood trees that there are, um, is, that, is that an industry here on the Eastern Shore? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we have one mill right still in existence, and it used to be a couple of others, that uh, cut exclusively <laughs> hardwoods. But they are up north of here. They're up in Talbot County and uh, up in Kent County, uh, Delaware. Uh, the hardwoods, the further you go down the shore, uh, the poorer the quality of your hardwoods, with the exception of, of some of the trees. Yellow poplar uh, on uh, fairly well-drained sites is, is, is really good, and a lot of that goes for veneer. Oh. Uh, and especially up and down uh, the flood plains, the old flood plains of the Pocomoke River, you'll find some this beautiful stands of, uh, of uh, yellow poplar, mm. a tulip poplar, some people call it. Yeah. Uh, in the south they call it yellow poplar, in the north they call it tulip poplar. How about cypress? Is there a use for cypress? Oh yeah, well that used to be used, uh, you know, uh, as, as siding on houses primarily and uh, used uh, in boat building or any area. Uh, this was, it was used a lot more before the uh, preservatives, the wood preservatives came in because it was very, it was more durable uh, without any treatment than any other wood. And uh, there's still, uh, there were some uh, big operations up and down the Pocomoke River where they got uh, the cypress out, nothing but the cypress. And uh, I don't think they've done it here, but I know in some places further south, where they would pull the cypress trees out in the rivers and float them. A lot of them would sink. And that's a big industry now. They're going and pulling up these uh, divers or, or finding these things. They won't let anybody know where they are, but they'll find the market first and then they'll go there and dive down and hook grabs onto these uh, logs that they floated down these rivers that sunk and pull them up and they find out that they're in perfect shape. No Solid kidding. Solid wood. Yeah. God. That's a, that's an industry. Huh. Now, just like uh, the mules, uh, horses and mules are pulling logs out uh, uh, out of the woods uh, <clears throat> with 
in modern equipment today, you can't get around through the woods like you, like you can with a horse or a mule. And there are guys now that specialize just in that. They have the hay burners or the mules. We call them hay burners because obviously the skidders use fuel oil, but you got to have some kind of fuel, so they have hay burners. Uh, we we'll use hay burners to go in and make selective cutting and just pull out a tree here or there, and cut it up into shorter lengths, and it doesn't damage any other trees or anything. But that's a very costly uh, operation compared to the modern day equipment. And, uh, but a lot of people, uh, the people that are uh, sort of environmentalists, don't want to disturb anything, they will hire somebody like that to, to, to select that, cut. To select cut. Yeah. Well, um, there uh, you keep hearing the term old growth timber. Um, at what point? Um, I mean, if if you have a, a hundred acres of loblolly pines, and let them grow instead of twenty five years, let them grow fifty years, or sixty, or seventy, or eighty years, uh, will they continue getting more valuable as they get bigger? Generally speaking, the loblolly pine, there are exceptions, of course, but generally speaking, the loblolly pine reaches its economic maturity at 50 years, plus or minus. Uh, depending upon the site that they grow on, some sites are areas of the soil is better than it is in other places, so uh, it'll, it'll grow a little bit longer, a little bit uh, bigger, but generally speaking, 50 years is when it reaches economic maturity. Once it reaches 50, it starts to decline. Sort of like me. Yeah. As the older me. you get, you <laughs> decline. <laughs> uh, but uh, old growth, uh, I guess if you were, my definition of old growth would be a pine tree that's uh, in its 70s. Uh, I would consider, or an older uh -huh. would be. But uh, as. Uh, Obviously, as the trees get older, uh, they, they're more subject to insects, they're more subject to disease, and consequently, they, they die. Uh, I found one tree up in Dorchester County that survived the uh, uh, saltwater intrusion of a hurricane that came up the bay back in the late 20s, I think it was, and then uh, it killed our, all of the trees except a few trees that were on what we call hummocks. They were up a little ways, and uh, the salt water didn't kill them, and they survived. And then uh, some years, not too many years after that salt water intrusion in uh, Dorchester County, in the, uh, down in the west, southwestern part of Dorchester County, uh, some tremendous stands of pine down there. Uh, after that salt water intrusion killed the pines, uh, they had a fire and it burned all of that up with the exception again of these trees that were up on these hummocks and they seeded them, they seeded in, seeded in that area again and it just came up in a blanket of pine, it's all even aged. But I found one tree down there that uh, uh, we use an increment bore to bore into the tree to determine the age and how fast it's growing, and et cetera. And uh, I bored into that, it was 12 inches long, all the way as far as I could, and I think I counted 175 years. Golly. And, uh, but some of the rings were so close together that we had to use a magnifying glass to be able to count them. They were just like, uh, the pages in a book that were that close together. <laughs> so that was a year they didn't grow very, very much. Well, because it was uh, most probably a thick stand of pine, and it, they, uh, a pine tree to maintain optimum growth needs approximately one third of its total height in crown, because you know your process of photosynthesis. The sunlight shines on the leaves, 
and the roots bring up the moisture and the minerals and the nutrients, et cetera, up to the leaves and the sunlight shines on them, photosynthesis, produces starch. That goes back and makes the tree grow. Every year that that happens, a layer of growth goes over the whole tree, right over every limb, just like an ice storm. Her ice gets on a tree, you know? That's the way a growth of wood gets on there. Mm -hmm. So if some point during its uh, existence, that crown gets less than 30% uh, or one third, it doesn't have the factory up there to produce the food. So it doesn't grow as fast. So the rings are closer together. Or it may be an extremely dry year or something like that that will also have some yeah. effect on it. But generally, it's, it's a crowding. And that's why a lot of people will see uh, truckloads of real small trees going down a road on a truck. It's, you know, six or eight inches of diameter. They say, oh, that's terrible because they're cutting these young trees. But what we do is, when we're managing the timber, is we go through and a stand and mark the trees that are crooked or diseased or have a real small crown on it or something is wrong with them in some way and try to <clears throat> leave the biggest and the best trees there to continue to grow and to maintain that crown ratio. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's part of, of, of the forestry thing. Management. Right. Yeah. The, um, there are a number of companies. The first one that comes to my mind is the E.S. Atkins Company that started out in the logging business, in sawmill business, I think in Powellville, eventually somewhere before the turn of the, of the 20th century, moved into Salisbury and became a lumber, full-fledged lumber company. Um, what are some of the other companies? Well, talk about E.S. Atkins if you want, but uh, how those companies evolved over the years using forestry and the timber industry as the, as the base of their business? Well, uh, one of the first ones that comes to mind is uh, Cropper Brothers out here in uh, God, Willards. Out of Willards. Uh, it's the third generation in there now uh, running that. Uh, mill, and it started out, uh, golly, I can't think of that guy's name now, that had a portable mill, and he eventually took that portable mill and made it a stationary mill, and then Cropper Brothers took it over, and over the years, they have modernized, they've gotten more modern equipment, bigger equipment, better equipment, etc., in it, and have, have a, a really nice mill. Now, what's their finished product? Is it lumber or is it piling? Both. 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 Uh, the, the, pi the, the piling and poles are the best products. They're the big money products. So they go through and pick those out first, uh, anyone that's straight enough to do those things. And then they run them through their machines and, and, and all and uh, make poles and or piling out of them. And uh, then the next thing they do, they cut the saw logs out of them and cut that up into lumber. A saw log makes lumber, that's what we call it. And then uh, the tops of the stuff is too small to make a, a log out of. They chip up for chips that go to the paper mills. Goes to Gladfelter or to Chesapeake. Uh, those are the main ones right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so every bit of that tree is used and they, they even use the bark now for, oh, yeah. for, for mulch. The, um, well, go ahead. <laughs> even uh, in some cases, they, uh, out in the woods, they have chippers that they chip up the, the limbs that they cut off uh, in some cases. And uh, in other cases, uh, especially it doesn't happen so much here on the shore, but down south, they even root up the stumps and they use those Hercules Paper Company, or Powder Company. They, uh, they go back and uh, uh, root these things up because they have so much pitch in them, or turpentine. Yeah. And they uh, uh, chip that up and cook it, and they get all kinds of products out of it as, as a result of that. And we're getting away from the eastern shore a little bit, but they have dogs trained 
now that can go through the woods and spot old stumps that are under the ground. And they can go. It's, from the odor. From I the, guess from, from the, the scent. Odor. Yeah. The scent. Wow. And, and they go there uh, with a dozer of some kind and dig a little bit and push that stump up out of the ground. And you can imagine that's very expensive so that it, the products that they get out of it are something else. Yeah. Uh, some of those, E.S. Atkins will go back to that. Yeah. They not only bought the timber off the land to use in their lumber business, but they bought the land as well. And then found out that if they, and I, I think of Grant Powell, my old friend Great Grant Forrester. Powell, uh, who would say, well, okay, we're going to cut the timber off this and then we're going to replant it because 20 years from now we'll have another growth to, to harvest. Um, consequently, I guess the E.S. Atkins come to Henry Parker told me one time that uh, they own something like 50-some thousand acres of of land on the on the Delmarva oh, Peninsula, Peninsula by buying the timberland and of course some of that now has become valuable development property and I guess that's the business they're in now. Yes, uh, but um, you mentioned Gladfelter. You used to work for the Gladfelter Pulpwood Company. Um, was it their was it their policy to buy the timber or buy the timber and the land? Timber and land. The main thing that they wanted was the land uh, so that they had a continuous supply of uh, pulpwood that they could always count on uh, rather than uh, having to count on private landowners furnishing the raw material. We, we could grow it. And uh, the interesting thing, I think, is that I remember in, uh, in the early 60s, Sam Dyke, and I uh, were buying timberland for uh, Gladfelter. And we, if we paid over $25 an acre for the land, that was expensive. Wow. And I that's in the 60s. That's in the 60s. And we bought a lot, a lot of land for $30 an acre. And I know a lot of sawmillers would buy a track of land, a track of timber, and in many instances, uh, they would say, uh, well, what are you going to do with that land? Talking to the landowner, what are you going to do with that land after we cut all the timber off of it? It's no good. I'll give you uh, $200 for it, you know. And it may be amount to a dollar an acre. I don't know what it was, but... In, in a lot of instances, the people say, well, you know, it's not going to do me any good. And they didn't realize the value that they had there, and they let these people buy that land for next to nothing. Mm -hmm. So all of the sawmills, I think without an exception, owned a lot of land, as, just as a result of buying the timber and uh, making an offer, ridiculous offer, and getting the land. Um, I'm thinking of drainage, tax ditches. If you're, if you're primarily a farmer and your main crops are truck crops or corn and soybeans or whatever it might be, uh, you take the most productive land out of what you own. Let's say you own 500 acres of land, 100 acres they call tillable land, and then the, the farmland, is, I mean the forest land is just something that's there and is not producing anything unless you think of it, the forestry and the, and the trees as a crop, I guess is, is one way of thinking of it. But uh, if you're used to, if your crop is watermelons and cantaloupes and cucumbers, you don't think of timber as a crop, do you? A lot of people don't, but uh, uh, people, uh, I would say generally speaking from, uh, the late 70s or 80s began to realize how valuable timber was or, or is on the shore. And in many instances, many instances, after uh, uh, I started the business of Parker Forestry Services, um, uh, especially in the states when they were being settled uh, and the taxes that they had to pay, they were able to sell timber off of that land uh, 
and pay those taxes when they inherited the property versus having to sell the land to somebody else. So uh, it became, and then uh, it, it was a, a, timber was a good nest egg. Uh, it had some shelf life. Um, even though it was 50 years old, you didn't, have to wait, you didn't have to cut it when it was exactly 50. You could wait until the market was right or until you needed it, mm -hmm. you know, four or five years in there. And uh, it educated a lot of people in that these farmers or, or people that own timberland would sell that timber to send their kids to college or to pay a big medical bill or something that came up. And as time went on and uh, uh, we as uh, consulting foresters and uh, Skip Jones is uh, still in the consulting business, he's the one that bought my business, Parker Forester Services, when you could help people realize a good return for that timber, we didn't have much of a selling job to get them to reforest because they realized that they had made a good return on their timber. So they wanted to plant it back, especially for their children and our grandchildren yeah. to have something. So there are other incentives that uh, have made people plant it trees and all, but the fact that they can make money on it, if you can make money growing timber, wouldn't you grow it? Yes, yes. <laughs> right. Well, we have, and you just mentioned that uh, farmers, we think of farmers owning a lot of timber land, but I guess there are a lot of investors, they're private landowners who are not farmers. Right. But they are timber land owners. Timber land owners. And you mentioned Gladfelter owns a lot of uh, forestry land, E.S. Atkins Company to this day owns a lot of forest land that was bought for the timber use and is still uh, there for timber. Um, what's the, uh, if you have a, a hundred acres, let's just say, and you, it's, it's Loblolly Pine primarily, and it's been there for 25 or 30 years, and you call Parker Forestry Service what do you suggest as a, a plan? Do you go in there and cut the whole thing, or do you cut it in sections? What's the, what's the average plan that would, you would use? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question in that uh, if it was uh, 30 years old, and uh, unless you actually needed an income, we would go in and look at that timber and say, hey, we would make some borings in it and look at it in general and everything and say, this timber is still growing. It's making money for you now. And you need to wait some more years because you'll realize a lot more from it. Uh, so that would be what we would do. Now, if you said, uh, hey, uh, I, I need some money. Times are tight like right now. I, I really need some money. Well, you say, well, one option would be maybe we can go in there and thin it out, help the stand, and also help you realize an income from that thinning. And that has become one of uh, uh, the big things on the shore right now. It used to be we couldn't get people to thin, but now we can because there's a, a still a demand in this area for pulpwood, uh, for chips. And uh, Johnson has bought uh, Chesapeake's chip mill down here. They are buying a in lot. In Pocomo. In Pocomo, yeah. Are buying a lot of uh, thin, what we call thin wood that uh, comes as, as a result of thinning. And the loggers, it used to be if you mentioned thinning to a logger, oh, I'm not going to do that. But now I just talked to one here a couple of weeks ago at the Maryland Forestry Association meeting, and he said, Ace, you won't believe us, but I'm starting to thin. He went 15 years, 10 years ago, he wouldn't have even given that a thought. I'm not going to do that. Is that because of the difficulty? It's much easier to go in and clear cut uh, with your equipment, right. big, big equipment and everything. Must take, uh, I guess, different equipment to. Yeah. When you say thin, do you thin it in rows almost? Some of it you thin in rows, and then in between, uh, you will take out, uh, say, every fourth row, sixth row of trees if it, if they're planted trees, 
and make that road. So you take out every tree in that. But then in between the roads, you would thin out the uh, less desirable trees and leave the, the better trees to grow into uh, so salt So you in, enjoy some instant income from that, and yet your long-range investment is still there growing and, and reaching its full potential. Yeah. I see. Well, and you're talking about some changes. Uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, timber was really in demand here on the shore. Uh, and I have seen tracks go as much as $400 and plus per thousand board feet. And the average stand would have the average, and some of them had a lot more, but the average stand had about seven, eight thousand board feet per acre. Mm. So you can figure how much you were, That's you a, were getting. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll get, we sold one track that was uh, nine acres, and it brought uh, just the timber, $100,000. Off nine acres? Off nine acres. And the lady that sold it had absolutely no idea what she had. Absolutely none. And as soon as she realized that, she said, I want to plant that back immediately. She didn't want government assistance or anything to plant it back because she had made it such a, it was a field that had been abandoned uh, on her father's farm and it had, had come back in beautiful timber. Mm. Obviously, they get that much money. Yeah, it's just perfect conditions for growing, right. I guess. Well, the the economy of the eastern shore uh, from 200 years back on, I guess, we think of the poultry industry, which is relatively a modern industry, last 100 years. Yeah. Uh, I guess forestry has gone back, way back past that as as being a... Uh, part of the economy here on the Eastern Shore. Yes, it, uh, it has. And uh, at one point, forestry was the second largest industry here on the shore. Uh, second to poultry. Second to poultry or agriculture. Oh, I, yeah. And some people like to throw forestry into agriculture, but uh, it is, I guess, related, but it, it's separate. But it, it was the second largest industry. We had a number of mills, and uh, gosh, I can remember when, uh, uh, like, anywhere from five to ten truckloads of piling per day would go off of this shore up in the northeast part of the United States because everything along the coast had to be built on piling. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot that, of that shipped by barge, some by rail. No, mostly by truck. By truck. Yeah. They, they could, that, that was a big advantage that we had in this region was our geographic location because they could haul a truckload of pollen to, to New York City in what, five or six hours. And a guy could come back and uh, go to bed and the next day have another load ready and take it up there. I see. And uh, uh, the pollen would bring, uh, I'm sort of guessing, because I don't know exactly what it sold on the market up there for, but double what uh, saw timber, uh, lumber would, uh, the same amount. And you didn't have to do that much to it. You didn't have to saw it up or anything. Have we, have we overforested on the shore? As, ha, have we f come to a time when the industry seems to be on the downturn it's on the downturn, and, and it's on the downturn uh, throughout the southeastern part of the United States. And uh, it may be in the western part, too. I'm not sure about that. I'm not that familiar with it now. But uh, it has, in the last seven, eight years, it has changed dramatically in that uh, <clears throat> it's a world market now. Uh, when I was in the business, I was very, very fortunate in that I got to travel quite a bit to a lot of different countries. And uh, to, to give you an example of one, uh, Brazil. Uh, international paper company, or U.S. champion, I've forgotten which one, 
and Wes Vaco went down to Brazil in the 40s, right after World War II, because Brazil was not producing enough timber uh, for their own needs. And these two companies went down there and uh, found out that the loblolly pine that we have here grows extremely well there. They can grow a loblolly pine in eight years, eight to 10 years, that it takes us 25 years to grow. Oh my gosh. And they, they plant these things and when you stick the tree in the ground, you have to step back real quick because it'll knock you over grow so fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the cost of shipping is is uh, much is taken yeah. over by the fact that it produces it so, so fast. fast. And uh, they are paying. When I was the last time I was in uh, Brazil, which was 10, 12 years ago now. They were paying over two thousand dollars an acre for farmland and planting it in trees, and their labor was so much cheaper. And as a result of getting what they need, they have overproduced. So they only the world they're in the world market now. Australia is another one. They didn't have a, a fast growing coniferous tree, and uh, Australia and New Zealand both. And through a lot of experimenting and all. Uh, they were, they were having to import lumber for their use and pulp. They have found that the Monterey pine that grows over on the Monterey Peninsula in California grows extremely well there. Oh. And consequently, I was down there uh, in uh, New Zealand not too many years ago, four or five years ago, and every port that you went by was piled up with logs being ready to ship out to markets that we in this southeastern part of the United States, which includes used to, Rome, have. used to have. The southeastern part of the United States used to be the breadbasket of the world as far as, as timber was concerned. Hmm. And we, we sort of, the forestry industry as a whole sort of lived on their laurels there for a while and didn't do the amount of research especially with genetics and getting things to grow faster and all that these other countries did. So consequently, now all of the big companies, including Gladfelter and Chesapeake, International Paper Company, Weyerhaeuser, these people that own hundreds of thousands of acres are selling off their land because they can't, the, the, the competition in the world market for the wood products is so great that in order to get the returns that their stockholders are crying for, they are having to sell off their timberland. Uh, International Paper Company, one of my closest friends, lives down in Georgia, just handled the sale of over 100,000 acres of, of their timberland. And they're selling it off to create income. Hmm. And Gladfelder have sold all of theirs. Chesapeake sold all of theirs. And most of the Chesapeake and Gladfelter land has gone to the state. Uh, Mr. Glenn Denning uh, bought up a lot of that. And uh, uh, I, it's being managed. I don't know whether it's being managed like a private landowner would manage it, but it is being managed. Uh, they have uh, uh, a consulting forester, Larry Walton, that's managing that timberland for them. And uh, Larry is an excellent forester, and he worked for Chesapeake for a long time. So, so he, he will say to the state, you need to harvest this portion of yeah. this, and et cetera, and realize some income from it. The, the uh, large tracts that were once owned by Gladfelter and Chesapeake and E.S. Atkins and others, the Wells family, um, what do you suppose the future of that land is as the world market is able to produce cheaper lumber uh, and pilings and that sort of thing? Um, what will be the next phase for those big tracts of timber on the eastern shore? Developed in the home sites? 
<laughs> well, that's, that's going to be a lot of it. Uh, we are getting uh, so, I guess, overpopulated worldwide. Uh, my feeling is that it's eventually going to come back. It's going to have to because it is a renewable resource. Timber is a renew renewable resource that we can continuously get. Uh, and uh, we've got a glut now. In, in the southeastern part of the United States, we've got more trees in the, than uh, we had back in the late 1800s. Really? Really. So more. we haven't over, the question, answer the question, have we overforested? The answer is no. No. We ha well, when you say overforested, you mean overcut, overharvested. Over yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Uh, you can go. Uh, uh, down there in places in uh, Georgia, and it's just hundreds of acres of pine trees that uh, they can't sell. They can't get in. They can't get enough money for it. Uh, my uh, close friend I'm talking about, uh, Billy Humphreys, uh, he owns a, a 2,000 acre tract. And he was uh, counting on that for retirement. The thinning is off of it. He had it all figured out, the growth and everything and uh, came time to cut it, and there's no dead gum market for it. Hmm. Uh, he's getting half, less than half of what he, had, at the rate it was going 10, 15 years ago, getting less than half of what it was then. How about, how about timber here? Uh, the same thing. Uh, last time I checked, uh, timber was going for like a little over $100 a thousand board feet. And I think at the prime, when it really hit the top, here was over 400, like I said. Wow. So that's a heck of a drop. Yeah. And there, there are not that many sawmills here now. There's Paul Jones, Milton Law's old mill, um, Cropper Brothers, and Dorchester Lumber Company. They're the main ones. We used to have eight or 10 mills. Had a big one down on the eastern shore of Virginia. There's none down on the eastern shore of Virginia. It used to be, uh, when I first came there uh, in 1960, I know of one, two, three, at least five sawmills were down there on the eastern shore of Virginia. Now, there are none. Hmm. But you think there might be, just as there's, there are cycles in the value of poultry, for instance, Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. Uh, corn and soybeans, the same way. They even sell futures in it and that sort of thing. You think that you think the timber, the value of the timber will come back up? I think it's going to have to. And, and uh, uh, this is through no data or study or anything that I know about. It's just my opinion. Uh, of course, growing timber is a long-term investment, where corn is an annual or, mm -hmm. or crop, sorry. So consequently, the, the cycles are longer, okay? So timber is down now, but our population, like I said earlier, is increasing worldwide. And we're going to have to produce more of it. And we, uh, we're finding that we're using more and more wood and wood waste for fuel now. You know, uh, at one point worldwide, wood was used for fuel more than anything else. Not too many years ago, especially in China. Mm. When I was in China, uh, they had very little timber. It was all used for for firewood. They, uh, you know, they they were like we if were. If that's what's available, that's what you use. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The peasants out in the, out in the countryside there, they, uh, hell, you'd just see miles of, of uh, bare land where they'd cut all the trees off. Yeah. And using it for firewood or to build a fence or to build a little house or whatever. You talked about the there are more trees on the eastern shore now than there were 100 years ago. Is there more land, is there more or less land in uh, cultivation? than there was, now that I understand is less because of the, the uh, growth of housing developments and that sort of thing. I wondered if it's, if it's more trees on less land 
Th you think? I think that's it. Oh. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I think there's less forest land total uh, than there was. I'm, I'm almost positive that that goes down every year and, and mainly as a result of development. Now, uh, there are laws in place that are trying to slow that down in that uh, uh, if you own a, a wooded lot and you want to build a house on it, you have got to go and medi mitigate and plant so many pine trees somewhere else, mm -hmm. maybe on open land or something. Uh, to compensate for for the footprint that you're making there with that house mm -hmm. or your home. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. So if you have uh, if you have a piece of land that maybe is not that good of uh, producing farm, you might use that land to help people mitigate for where they're building on some what used to be good farmland. But they're, they'll, they cut the trees down, so they have to mitigate on a piece of property somewhere. So you yeah. can offer that as a place to do your mitigation. Some people are in that business of yeah. just finding that. Yeah, doing yeah. That. Ace, we want to thank you for helping us understand a little bit about the forestry industry and its history here on the Eastern Shore. It's been very, very interesting, and we want to thank you for doing it. My pleasure. Love doing it. I love to talk about forestry. Well, <laughs> you spent, what, 48 years in it, so yeah. uh, for a young man like you, that's a long time. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to thank you for being with us here on Digitizing Delmarva Heritage and Traditions. <laughs>